Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the last lecture, I introduced you to Poincaré maps. Now Poincaré maps are really one of the fundamental methods that we have for analyzing high dimensional dynamical systems, right? We started this lecture series with 1D dynamical systems, then we moved to 2D, and in those cases we could sketch them out on the board. But as we saw with the Lorenz system, things get much more complicated very, very fast, as soon as we go from three dimensions and up. And this is where Poincaré maps come in. Now, one of the fundamental principles of a Poincaré map is that it's useful in identifying the existence of limit cycle solutions. And the reason for that is because those limit cycle solutions are solutions that go away from the Poincaré map and come back exactly to where they started. Now, another thing that you might remember from the Lorenz system is that I talked about an unstable limit cycle. We had a subcritical Hopf bifurcation. The question is, how did I know that it was unstable, right? In, in a planar dynamical system, we can analyze stability of these things sort of by sketching it. We can kind of figure things out using our phase plane analysis. But in higher dimensional systems, it's much more complicated. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In fact, we are going to look at stability of fixed points in the Poincaré section. And that is going to lead to stability of these uh, limit cycles. So let's say, let's let... P be a uh, Poincaré map. Okay, so I'm already sort of starting where we t uh, left off last lecture. And I'm going to say let X star a fixed point, which we already saw means that P of X star is equal to x star, okay? So again, this is the fundamental difference between discrete iterative systems, such as Poincaré maps, and continuous time systems. Continuous time systems, you set the derivative equal to zero, no change. For a discrete time system, you are solving the mapping equal to itself, right? It's giving you the same number or same value back that you put into it. Where I started in the Poincaré section is where I come back to in the Poincaré section. Okay, so now let's talk about stability. So let's let, let's say V0 uh, be a deviation. So just like how we analyze stability for continuous time dynamical systems uh, from X star. So essentially, that means that we can track where we will go next. So for example, the deviation next, V1 from X star, well, this is just the Poincaré map applied to your X star plus the initial deviation, okay? So I'm putting everything in terms of X star. I'm sort of centering my analysis around this. And you know why I'm going to do this. Taylor series. It's always Taylor series. So in this case, I can do a Taylor series. I get P of X star. That's good because that is going to cancel right here. And now I've got, let's say, dp of x star. This is the Jacobian matrix of the Poincaré map evaluated at x star times v0 plus, and I'm just going to do the quadratic order, right? So again, you've seen this before. It's basically the same process. The only difference here now is that it's doing this in discrete time. So... I get an associated linear mapping, right? The linearized Poincaré section says approximately, you know, V0 is small, so I can neglect this term right here. Then I can take where my initial deviation from X star and I can multiply it by a matrix now. Remember the Jacobian matrix to get where I'm going to go next. And in particular, what I can do is I can get a stability criterion. So I could say that I have the following stability criterion. So just like stability in continuous time systems, let's say let lambda 1 through lambda n minus 1. Now remember, the Poincaré section is one dimension smaller than the original dynamical system, okay? So again, we're picking up from where we left off in the last video. The original system is n-dimensional. 
the Poincaré mapping is n minus one dimensional. That means that the linearized Jacobian matrix here is n minus one by n minus one. It has n minus one eigenvalues. Okay, you can you can come up with any sort of naming you want here. You don't have to use n minus one, but I'm going to keep things consistent. So you know, let's let these be eigenvalues of my Jacobian matrix. Then I would say, so then the closed orbit corresponding, so the closed orbit of the continuous time system, again, Poincaré map, uh, corresponding to X star is stable if and only if, well, if the modulus of each one of these eigenvalues is smaller than one. Okay, so this is very, very different than what you saw in continuous time, right? Now, for discrete time, I have to have all my eigenvalues lying inside of the unit circle in the complex plane. It's much different, right? And it's different because you have an iterative process here. Now, essentially what this says is that if you have even a single eigenvalue outside of the complex circle, uh, outside of the, the unit circle in the complex plane, then you have an unstable periodic orbit. So if you go back to my Lorentz system, how did I know that I had unstable uh, periodic orbits there? Well, I looked at the Poincaré section associated to it, I took a linearization of the Jacobian, and I found that one of the eigenvalues, at least one of the eigenvalues, is outside of the unit circle. Now, sort of why, where does this come from? Well, it's actually quite easy to see. So let's say, let this, these EJs uh, be a basis of eigenvectors. Eigenvectors for the lambda Js. Okay, so eigenvalue, eigenvector. That's all I'm trying to say. So then I could do this. I could write my v0, my initial v deviation, as just the superposition along the eigenvectors. Cj, Ej, it's a basis, right? You might have to review a little bit of linear algebra. Hopefully you don't, hopefully you remember this. But this is just an eigenvector expansion. But then, this implies that v1, which is given by matrix multiplication of the Jacobian, by v0. Well, I, this is a linear operation. I can apply it to each eigenvector individually, but because these are eigenvectors, then they just become multiplied by lambda j. So essentially what happens here is in front of each coefficient of this span, I get an eigenvector, or yeah, an eigenvalue, pardon me. Okay, a lambda j. And so if you keep doing this, right, so if I repeat, if I do this k times, then this tells me, let's say vk, so my deviation after k iterations through the Poincaré section, then I'm just going to get k eigenvalues jumping up out of this thing, right? So my summation for each iterate forward, one iterate forward, one eigenvalue, two iterate forwards, square of the eigenvalue, three cube of the eigenvalue. And here I go, I just get lambda j to the power of k, cj e to the ej, uh, e sub j. And that tells me that if these things are smaller than one, then I get that their powers go to zero as k goes to infinity. So if I iterate long enough, 
I am sort of contracting, right? All these eigenvalues are inside the unit circle, so I'm pulling this down. And so that means that my deviation after each step is getting closer to the fixed point. And in particular, as the, the iterations through this thing goes to infinity, so as time goes to infinity, I am taking VK to zero, and therefore I am converging to the fixed point. And then you can also turn this on its head, right? Of course, if one of these is even out, is bigger than the absolute value of one, then it's gonna blow up. And you have a direction that's pushing you away. So you get maybe a saddle structure, or maybe you just get instability in every direction. But that's where this stability criterion comes from. And in particular, we call the eigenvalues, so the lambda j are what are called the flow k multipliers. So that's the name of this video. These are the critical component that we're learning about here. These eigenvalues of the linearized Poincaré section about a fixed point are called the flow k multipliers. Now, this is related uh, this is named after a 19th century French mathematician named Gaston Floquet. He was around right around the same time that Poincaré was. It turns out that what they were working on was quite related, although Poincaré was doing something slightly more general. Um, but there's a large theory in dynamical systems called Floquet theory, and it's really for trying to understand these connections and these stability properties of uh, these limit cycles in these closed orbits to these dynamical systems. And again, just like we've seen before, everything always comes down to eigenvalues, okay? So the route that I took to get you to flow K multipliers is through the Poincaré map, but there's another way to do it, and that comes from flow K theory. So that's sort of outside the scope of this lecture series, but uh, again, you arrive at the same things. It's just eigenvalues. It's always eigenvalues every time, but it's slightly different because you need them inside of the unit circle of the complex plane. Let's look at an example. So here's one from the last video. This was a simple one, our little polar oscillator, which we saw had a unique limit cycle. We actually were able to find the Poincaré map, which we took to be every time you cross the positive x-axis, basically when theta goes through zero mod two pi. So we saw that we had a Poincaré map P of R, which was given by 1 plus e to the minus 4 pi, r to the minus 2 minus 1, and then to the power of minus 1 half, right? So it's a very ugly expression, but it's an expression nonetheless. We also knew that we had this, p of 1 is equal to 1. And so we can determine the stability of this thing just by looking at its flow k multipliers. And this implies that dp of 1, so the Jacobian matrix here, it's a scalar value. It's a 1 by 1 matrix. And in this case, you know, it's just sort of p prime of 1 if you want. This is e to the minus 4 pi, which this value is between minus 1 and 1. Right? So this tells us that the limit cycle is stable. So that tells us that, you know, if we start close to this limit cycle in, say, the Poincaré section, then we are going to converge into uh, that limit cycle as the number of iterates of the Poincaré section go to infinity. And of course, what that means is that as time goes to infinity in the continuous time system, right? Don't lose track of sort of the correspondence between the Poincaré section and um, what's going on here with the continuous time system. All right, I want to do one more example, and it's much more involved, okay? So this is really going to sort of step up the complexity from things that we've already seen in this class, okay? So I'm gonna fix a capital N greater than or equal to one, and I'm gonna consider, okay, so I'm gonna consider an n-dimensional system. Here I'm gonna use the Greek letter phi, phi sub i, so I have many different elements in my system. Time derivative is equal to some capital omega, a constant, 
plus a sine phi i plus 1 over n, and then the sum from j equal 1 to capital N of sine of phi j, where each one of these phi i's is going to be a flow on a circle, okay? So this is n, n, capital N, whatever number you want it to be. It could be 100, it could be 2, it could be 57, 39 million, whatever. It's all the same dynamical system. And it's all of them are considered as flows on the circle. And take a look at this. Each one looks like my flow on the circle that I looked at for a one-dimensional system, except that I have this coupling term that kicks on the end. And what is the coupling term on the end? One over the number of oscillators and then a sum. That means that I'm looking at an average inside of the sine of each of these angles. So what is the dynamical system saying? Well, we've got this system that we looked at for the firefly, right? This, this sort of nonlinear bottleneck exhibiting type system. And then it takes a look around. It says, what's everybody else doing? Take the average of what everybody else is doing and use that to influence myself, right? This is a nonlinear aggregation of all of these things. It actually turns out to be a model for an overdamped uh, Josephson junction in parallel with a restrictive load, okay? So this is coming from a 1991 paper uh, by Sang and collaborators. And in particular, what I wanna look at is a particular solution to this thing that's called an in-phase solution. So in-phase solution. Now, if something is in phase, it means everybody's acting together, okay? So if I'm walking with three people on either side of me, we would be walking in phase if all of our steps are walking together. And so what that would mean is that phi 1 of t is equal to phi 2 of t, which is equal to every single other one of these elements. Everybody's doing exactly the same thing. And in this case, I'm going to use phi star to be the common solution. So this would tell me, you know, if all of these things are the same, then the summation here is basically just summing up n of the same elements, dividing by n. So this actually just becomes omega plus a plus one sine of phi star. All right, a plus one sign of all of the same thing inside of this. It's a one dimensional flow in the circle. And we also know that this thing has periodic solutions. So periodic solutions. If capital Omega is larger than absolute value of a plus one. Again, this is just flow in the circle. We did this. Okay. So I know that it looks complicated, it's just a really big version of something we've already done and, and way at the beginning of the lecture series. So the question is, is the in-phase solution, right? So let's imagine we're in this parameter regime. Everybody is oscillating together, okay? We're all locked in to this in-phase solution. Is it stable? We can ask ourselves, is this a stable solution? Well, what I would like to do is I take each one of my oscillators and I want them to be the in-phase component. Solution of this piece, just going around the circle. Plus, I'm going to use eta, which is a little deviation. And so, if you put this into the dynamical system and you linearize around this thing, you will find that the linear dynamical system satisfied by the eta i's is going to be a times cos of phi star of t and times eta i and then plus the coupling term so plus cos phi star of t and then uh, multiplied by the average of all of these etas. So j equal one 
to capital N of eta i. Okay, so try and arrive at that on your own. Again, all I'm doing is a Taylor expansion. It's linear in all of the etas. Pardon me, this should be eta j. I'm summing over everything here. And then I'm gonna introduce a change of variable. My change of variable, well, I'm going to introduce a new variable mu, which is just the average of what everybody's doing. It's this term right here. So that's this. And then I will introduce another term, psi, to be the difference between neighboring elements or successive elements, if you will. A to I plus one minus A to I for all I equal to one to N minus one. Okay, so this actually, there's capital N of these variables. Take the average here and then just look at the differences between these two things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of speed through some of the details here. I want you to try and work this out on your own, but you can actually find that this gives a dynamical system for the size Okay, so you're going to take derivatives, you're going to subtract off each one of these pieces. This gives you something really, really nice and simple. And it turns out to give you a cos phi star of t and then times psi i. This term is in common between every single one of these. So when you, when you subtract them, goodbye average term and all you get is this. So you get a to i plus one minus a to i, which is psi i, okay? Again, try and do it. It's difficult, but it's worth doing. This is a linear dynamical system. Turns out I can solve this with separation of variables. So separation of variables. And essentially what I'm gonna get here is I'm going to divide this off and I'm going to get the integral of d psi i divided by psi i is equal to, okay, so let's take a look at this, the integral of what's left here, a cos psi star of t, and then, uh, pardon me, times dt, all right, separation of variables, the size on one side, the t's on the other side. Okay, now I would like to change the variable into, instead of integrating t, I would like to integrate psi, uh, sorry, phi, and I'm going to use this expression right here, right? So we've seen this uh, over and over again. So let's do this again. The in this becomes the integral of psi i over psi, this is sort of what we did with the bottleneck, right? Whenever we change variables here, this becomes the integral of a cos phi star. I'm gonna leave the t dependence out now. And then times, or sorry, divided by eta, uh, sorry, omega plus uh, a plus one sine of phi star, and then d phi star. Just change of variables using the dynamical system. And in this case, so this can easily be computed, right? So let's say over one period, over one period, uh, i.e., so one period is five, uh, five star going around the circle once. So IE phi star from zero to two pi. Well, this would be essentially if you track it from starting from zero to going to two pi, this would be a Poincaré map, right? Again, this is flowing all the way around the circle. So I've got myself a way of tracking a Poincaré map. Well, this gives me taking the integral here, I get ln, so I get ln of psi i of t divided by psi i of zero. Again, integrating from zero to two pi here. 
uh, this is equal to, again, this might be an annoying thing for you to do, but you can put this into Wolfram or, or any sort of symbolic calculator for you. Again, it's not a calculus class. I don't really care. You could do substitution. You could easily solve this if you really wanted to. Uh, but nonetheless, this is equal to a over a plus one uh, and then multiplied by ln of capital omega plus a plus one uh, sine of five star from uh, zero to two pi. Now, let's take a look at this. Zero and two pi inside of this thing are gonna be the same value, right? Sine is equal to zero. So I get this is actually equal to zero. Okay, uh, what does this actually show? Well, this shows that ln of these two things is equal to zero. This tells me that psi i of t is equal to psi i of zero for all i. Similarly, you can show, so also, you can show that mu capital T is equal to mu of zero, same thing, right? So I just did this for psi so far. If you do the same thing for the dynamical system for mu, you can show the same property. And what does this all mean? Well, when you put this all back into the original deviation variables eta, right? So I've got mu and psi, trace it back to eta. This tells me that eta i of t is equal to eta i of zero. What does that mean, right? Remember, we started this thing talking about stability of periodic solutions, and we started talking about flow k multipliers. Flow k multipliers are telling you if you're getting closer or further away from the, the periodic orbit. I haven't really had a Poincaré section here, so what is going on? Well, eta was the initial deviation, right? And through all of this work, it says that after I complete one full cycle of my periodic solution, right? That would be going back to the Poincaré section. So maybe your Poincaré section is when phi, uh, phi star is equal to zero mod two pi. So starting in the Poincaré section, flowing all the way out and around and coming back to the Poincaré section, nobody moved. We moved back to exactly the same point. So is this thing stable or unstable? It's sort of neither. It's like a big center, right? Nobody's getting further away, but also nobody's getting closer together. In some sense, this is a center. This is very much a nonlinear center. It's a very, very complicated process. What's going on here? All the flow K multipliers are one. They're all, you know, nobody's changing. Nobody's getting further away. Nobody's getting closer together. And again, this system is as high dimensional as you want it to be. It could be a million dimensional, it could be a trillion dimensional, or it could be two dimensional. But in that case, in all of these situations, we're able to compute those flow K multipliers and find that they're all just one. Nothing happens in this system. It's really, really strange. Now, to give you a little bit of insight what happens here, this is actually a consequence of what's called a reversible symmetry. Now, reversibility is not something we've spoken about yet in this class, um, but it is something that we find all throughout natural and physical processes, the ability to sort of uh, reverse the direction of time and maintain the solution. So I'm not going to go into it. I'm going to leave that for you for a little bit of further reading. But what I want you to see is that we can work through all this. We can find flow K multipliers of exactly one. All right, when we come back in the next video, we're going to start talking about just discrete iterative processes. Okay, we're going to leave the Poincaré mappings behind, keep them as an example, and really just start thinking about what can happen with these mappings and what can we kind of investigate what can we find out about dynamical systems through them. I'll see you in the next video, everyone.